Hello there, I'm K-Ball, and welcome to Human Skills, where I interview tech industry leaders about all the non-technical skills that go into success in the tech industry. Garma Sahai grew up with Google, spending almost 20 years with the organization through a series of engineering roles, followed by management and finally director of engineering. Throughout her time there, she not only led technically, but became increasingly involved in initiatives around human impact, including but not limited to being inclusion lead for DEI programs in the Google Ads organization. We talked about a number of things. We talked about authenticity. We talked about management and what managers can do to create safe spaces for diverse teams. But the overwhelming thread in this conversation was about caring, how important it is to truly care about your work and about people, how to expand your circle of caring, and how to care for yourself. Please enjoy this conversation with Garima Sahai. Garima, welcome to the show. Hi, Kevin. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. Um, let's get started because I'm excited. You have some good stuff to talk about. So maybe let's start with having you introduce yourself and give a little bit of your background and how you came to care about these things I've been calling human skills. Yeah, no, thanks for the opportunity. Um, I myself am, uh, I came to the U.S. as an immigrant grad student back in 2001 from India, and I was here at grad school doing my computer science uh, master's at Stanford. Uh, after graduating, I joined a startup in my area of specialization, which was information retrieval and databases at that time. <clears throat> and that startup turned out to be Google over the years, and uh, that has been an amazing journey. Um, I was, uh, I grew at Google as an individual contributor, a software developer, initially on the Google Books project, um, which is near and dear to heart, just both because of doubling down on the mission of making information accessible to all. And then the latter half, I also grew as a technical leader and a manager, um, uh, ultimately as a director in the ads organization for local and map ads, um, almost com completing 20 years of my career there. So it, it was an awesome ride. It, I didn't start that journey with that intention, but like, you know, life leads us in different ways, uh, sometimes different from what we plan. It turned out to be great. I'm a mom of two um, awesome kids uh, who are going through the public school system here in Los Altos, care a lot about education in general. Um, and yeah, uh, more lately, I have been involved in a lot more in social impact efforts, both while I was at Google, including my role as a DEI lead or a women in tech mentor or getting engaged with google.org. And um, now more directly, and um, I want to devote more of my time um, there in um, nonprofits and social impact organizations, which are using technology for good and equity in particular. Yeah. It's kind of amazing how you, you almost grew up with Google, right? Google went through all these different phases and you went through different phases as well. Um, I'm going to pick some threads from there to follow. So uh, one is you called out DEI and you've been deeply involved with that throughout. And I think you know something we talked about before we got on is, you know this is something almost everyone wants to do the right thing on this. They want to do something uh, that is helpful and uh, equitable across folks. Uh, but a question I've heard a lot is, well, okay, so I want to do the right thing. Like, what does that actually mean for me as a manager? What do I need to do tactically to provide a good, equitable um, you know, setup? That's a great question, Kevin. And before I kind of start with my perspective or opinion, I want to say a disclaimer, right? I am in no way an expert on this topic. This is a deep and complex topic, which has evolved as society has evolved, as well as the amount of attention we are giving to it has changed over time. It has been a journey for myself. Um, you know, I am uh, I'm a woman. I classify as she, her. And, you know, this whole thing about calling out your she, her uh, pronouns is a new thing too, like we are all learning. But um, my my core always has been, do we treat everyone with the same amount of respect as a human and also make sure we give uh, folks the same opportunities um, and regardless of their background. I think that's that's what I think the core aspect to me uh, is about DEI. And so this is not saying that we need to go out and do something special for a certain subset of people or we might need to in certain cases, but I'm saying this is not just about, this is about essentially giving humanity the same chance 
irrespective of where they start or where they were born or how they were, you know, how they look and other things. So um, given that, some tactical things that you were asking about as a manager, and this is a great question because it keeps coming up. I do believe that 99%, if not 100% of humanity starts out with the intention of doing good. It's just we don't always know how. Uh, I would say in my experience and what I've seen around me, it starts with something as simple as building psychological safety within your teams or your group, where people can come in and share their opinion or feel safe enough to um, to call out things which are not comfortable. Because I think that's part of the learning process. Um, there are things, all of us grew up with our own, you know, setups and biases, and we don't even realize where some things might not be okay to certain subsets of people. So um, given that we want to make our workplace a, a, a productive, happy place, we want to make sure there's room for people's opinions and people having that comfort to share when they are not feeling comfortable. Uh, so that's the psychological safety part. The other part is creating a space where you actually celebrate differences as opposed to suppressing them. And this can be something as small as, you know, some people do this, they call out different holidays and festivals as we go through the year, as opposed to just focusing on the main ones where we get time off. Other people, um, you know, actually create offsites or um, get togethers where they encourage people to bring in their cultures, like a multicultural potluck, right? We are all going to have, you know, and get to learn a little bit more about each other through food, which seems to be a common connector across the board. So, um, those are some uh, small things. The other things which get actually trickier is what happens when somebody comes to you with a problem. You know, somebody felt something was off and they are not feeling happy or they are feeling upset about it and they come to you as a manager. I think that that is another place where we can really uh, make a difference. One, give a full listening, a caring and listening ear because sometimes we have our own notions and preconceptions and we tend to block out just like machine learning models i think we have too much data already in our heads so we tend to we suppress <laughs> yeah so we tend to suppress those uh, you know minor signals but it is really important and i think that is a very human skill you know mm -hmm. we know mm -hmm. that we we can overfit based on how we have grown up in society so just having that consciousness and keeping that in mind when we are uh, listening to somebody say what they felt or what they feel, you know, uh, encountered so that we have an open mind. And after that, I think a lot of us, by the way, have this notion and we, we are in the tech culture, the engineering culture of problem solving. And so our immediate uh, reaction is, oh, OK, how do I help solve this problem? How do I make this go away? Right. How do I get back to that equilibrium? But I think uh, another human skill here is not be conscious of that, that we are naturally problem solvers and we may want to take a step back and kind of see, is this person actually looking for a solution to the problem? Is this person actually just looking for somebody to listen to what and empathize? Because there's some things that are too widespread, too hard, too big for us to change in our individual teams. But if we can show support, if we can show a listening ear to a person who's coming to us, that itself actually achieves a lot of it. that that makes the person feel like, oh, my manager is part of my team. They understand. And after that, if we do have certain if something is egregious, something's wrong, you know, sometimes you would need to think about pulling in HR, making sure you're doing the right thing by the company as well as the individual. But I also feel like empowering the people on your team to share out the problem where they are comfortable. Because sometimes, again, there are a lot of smart people around us. As a manager, I may or may not have the perfect bullet here, but if other people around us know that, hey, one of us finds this not so great, it may not even be that big of a deal, but they all might make some effort to not make that situation happen again. So helping them share or problem solve together, creating that opportunity, is also uh, another thing we can do as leaders and managers. These are some very entry point things I'm sharing, but mm -hmm. I don't want to take up the whole time, so I'll let you lead. Yeah, no, these are these are good. So coming back, making sure I, I'm summarizing. Um, so the first piece was around how do you create a space that 
is psychologically safe, where people can be themselves, uh, and in fact, celebrates differences, right? Bringing forward, uh, not only can people bring themselves forward, but we celebrate the fact that I'm bringing something that is different from the others around me. And that is, um, you know, something that can be embraced with curiosity or excitement or whatever, but kind of in a positive way. Um, and then the second thing that I heard was essentially being a being open, you know, let being someone that people can come to to talk about these things, um, listening carefully, not ruling out different things, not jumping to conclusions, and testing the waters a little bit before jumping into problem solving. Is this a problem that needs to be solved? Is this a problem that I am the right person to solve? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think those interact with each other, your, your suggestion about taking it to the team, that works really well if you've created a psychologically safe culture where that is a conversation that can be had in a safe way. Yeah. So I'm actually going to, so I, I know you said these are entry level, but I wanna, I'm going to push for even more entry level. What would you do coming into a culture to start creating that psychological safety? I think at some basic level, everything starts with connection. So once we actually um, start building relationships with people where we where we actually go out and try to know a little deeper about them, just about, besides just the work they are doing, again, as a team, which is working on some project and product, of course, our focus is going to be on some of those deliverables, the work that is being done, how well we are doing actually the uh, design and the system and whatnot. But I think, uh, again, as a human, as a leader, as a manager, there needs to be an effort to take the time to get to know the people a little deeper. I think that is kind of a fundamental piece in establishing a space. Once we know our people and they know us a little better, the next level thing that happens is a certain amount of trust building. Uh, you know, And this can happen in very simple things like somebody needs to take a mental health day off. And you know they have, they have had some challenges. They want to, this is really important for them. You support them. You create that space that, hey, you know, I'm going to take off this work from your plate. We are going to distribute it among ourselves. And, you you know, you are you take the time you need. When you come back, we are here for you. Uh, that just creates the next level of trust. Uh, and this is just an example, but it could be something, uh, you know, not necessarily um, a neat thing, but somebody is having a baby and they are going, uh, you know, they're planning out their paternal or maternal leave and how the team uh, rallies around them. Um, so that that's that trust, I would say connection, then trust, and then um, intentionally creating some spaces where people are encouraged even to be vulnerable, where you actually come out and share. And this can start with a work related thing, too. For example, um, a product or feature failed at, at, an, at onset or there was some problems and we had to withdraw or roll back a release and you come together as a team to discuss now, how do we do that actually sets an example for how you can discuss even bigger, deeper problems, sometimes even personal. Um, are you blaming people or no? You're just looking at the problem and you're actually supporting each other to see how we cannot make the same mistakes again. So, or, um, you know, if if we realize that somebody is really not good at something, uh, they actually get very stressed out about something, how does the rest of the team come come up and help with that function or need uh, when we actually need to do something um, uh, important. So I think that that's the next level. So it's relationship or connection, trust, creating spaces, setting examples where people can make mistakes and not really regret being caught in that, right? It's not about them. It's not personal. It's about what we together are trying to achieve. I think that's a sense of team and that space where you can be vulnerable. And I think as a leader, it's really, really important to take some first steps there because it's a really hard thing for people to come out and share uh, mistakes or harder things going on in life if they don't see other people doing that. And who starts that cycle? It has to be the leader who has to show, you know, you have to sometimes come out and say, hey, I'm just dealing with this you know, a teenage kid at home and it's really hard right now. So my mental space is split sometimes. And again, I'm making a small example. It could be anything in life. We all have other things going on. So um, yeah, those are some ideas that come to my head on that question. I love that. 
Okay. Uh, so shifting gears a little bit, though, I think to something that is, is somewhat related to this. So a, a theme that came up when we were preparing for this conversation was this concept of caring. And in some ways, we've been talking about that already, right? Like, why do we invest in DEI and, and creating safe spaces? Because we care about the people we're working with, um, regardless of their background. But I think there's something more than that. So I'm curious, you know, and, and actually... Google is a really interesting example there because you know, I, I also live in the Bay Area. I know a ton of people who worked at Google. And one of the things that has struck me is how many people worked there for a very, very long time and cared very, very deeply about more than just this is a job. You know, they, they had this sense of almost like missionary, like this is, re this is my life's work. This is really important. And it feels a little bit like that's gone away in recent years. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of, that's a lot of different things. Let's maybe start with, you know, what, what do you think about when we talk about this idea of caring in a sort of work perspective? So I have a, a very short, interesting story. When um, I, I was asked to become a manager, actually, I was tech leading a team. I was unsure. I was actually nervous. Two reasons. One, I feel as a woman, I felt like my software engineer title was hard earned. And I felt like I would be diluting it with manager. So I was a little reluctant there. But the other one was also, I was not sure if I could really be a good manager and a technical person and a leader at the same time. And I think this is something many of us struggle with in general, I realized over the years. But um, one of my ex-managers, actually, she, uh, I asked her, like, do you think I can be a good manager? And she was she just said a short thing. She said, you know, Garima, I think there isn't like a recipe or a training to being a great manager. And by the way, this resonates even with being a great par parent, I realized, as I, as I, as you said, I grew with Google. And so there were multiple things happening in parallel in my life. I became a parent, I became a manager. It was actually on my second maternity leave, I became a manager for the first time. And um, she said, the main thing is, if you really truly care for the people you are re leading, you will automatically show up as a good manager. And I think that was a very simple thing. It was very crystallized, but I think it holds the essence. When you care about the team, when you care about the product you are leading, automatically you will be putting a lot more effort than is required by the job. And the outcomes will reflect that because the product will show up, you know, in way better in ways um, because you deeply cared the people will go above and beyond to do things because they know it's not just about the job or the task at hand. It's about somebody who is noticing their work, who cares about their long-term growth and um, things get aligned. So I think that's where the caring piece uh, started for, uh, from. And um, I'm sorry if I missed your main question there. No, I, th I think that's, that is important. So let's, let's kind of highlight how that shows up in different ways. Cause I think, you know, many engineers, I, I know they care very deeply about their work in different ways. Um, as you highlight being a manager in some ways is about caring for people. Um, I think there's also this aspect of caring for the community or, or something mm -hmm. around that. So I don't actually have a coherent question here, but I'd love to kind of expand more on, you know, how some examples maybe of how you've seen this show up. Yeah, I think in the caring for people aspect, especially your reports as a leader or manager, there are multiple ways you can be a manager. You can actually uh, really take interest in the work they are doing and go deeper with them in that, in terms of problem solving, uh, you know, helping them uh, with their code and output and stuff. You can, um, you can go, I would say, next level deep and care about what do they want out of their work in a slightly longer term time frame. It's it's not about delivering this project. It's like, where do you want to go? And I would say that's a step two depth. And uh, step three depth is caring about that human, that person, because work or this, this job may be one aspect of their whole. And a lot of things interplay in our lives. So when we care about the whole, we can actually see a bigger picture. And when something else is draining them out, work also suffers. So we are actually partnering with them 
in making progress on the whole which i think is a net win for everything involved but but it requires patience and it requires time because for example there was a time when i had a report who was and this was during covid and i think this was a pretty common thing which was happening this was a single person who was living in an apartment they were not allowed to go anywhere they did not have roommates or other partners so basically their social connection was the job and google used to provide a lot of things where people could stay at job pretty much um, you know the whole um, from morning till dinner time and then just go and now they were suddenly cooking for themselves they did not have people to hang out and it was a really hard time for them and yes we did talk about the project that they were assigned to and the progress they were making but i think in in more of our deeper conversations i realized this person's really struggling to just be and at that time you know having all these ex- expectations so we had a uh, um more productive conversation i would say in saying how do you take care of yourself so that you can show up better at work you need to take the time off you need some resources from work which can help you um you know do we need to figure out something where you get to interact at least virtually with more people so that that can become your support system so i think um yeah that's an example i would say like i said three levels i think you can even go deeper but there's also like i would say this is a two way street and one thing i sometimes now feel we tend to forget when we are trying to care too much for others is taking care of ourselves so there is that aspect too you, you to be able to care for others to give to people to community i think the individual also needs to make sure that they are um, um, nourishing themselves and doing and not only does that help us as individuals but also it sets an example again around us when we do that we say hey i have to take this week off because i'm just not able to deal with the five things and i'm going to actually turn off my email so guys so you know and that happened i used to be actually one of the poorer examples earlier on in my management career where i would reply to emails on weekends i would reply after hours and to be honest after hours is sometimes a necessity you know when you have young children you put them to bed and that's when you pick up your laptop again and get and i think that was fine once i told people that hey this is how i am splitting up my work time this does not require you guys to be on at that time and i actually started using the scheduled send feature of gmail which i think also helped the scheduled sends are key yeah i i also offset my schedule partially because of children and other things and yeah you it is key but okay so something i'd love to kind of dig in there i love your levels of caring i think that is really powerful to think about and think about how you can deepen that one of the questions that occurred to me as we were going through that is like how does someone deepen the extent to which they care and and in particular i've seen cases where when you burn out or when you overextend yourself personally and to your your point like there's a lot of personal care that goes into this like people will get to the point where they say you know what i just don't care it's not in the in the line of what i have to what i'm being measured on or or it's too long term or just i don't have the bandwidth so i guess the the question i'd have is you touched a little bit on self care as a piece but like how would you say someone is a new manager and they're not used to these like levels of care how would you you kind of teach or encourage them to expand their circle of caring or when should you not expand your circle of caring i think um it's a great question and i i do hear you on the burnout thing that has been there have been times where you reach a point where you're like you know nothing else matters right i i i don't it doesn't i don't care at all but i think that goes back to that point that means that we have not been caring for ourselves i just i have this i guess huge faith that in general humans tend to have a tendency to give when they are taking good care of them, when they are in a healthy place so i think that's an alarm bell actually when you are getting to that point it is right when you're getting to that point where you stop caring that means hey buddy it's time to take care of yourself and i think maybe the best way to encourage or teach somebody to care deeper or in those levels for somebody else is to first 
mirror it how it would be for them are you caring enough for yourself are you just doing the job and producing the output and going home and then getting up in the night and then again you know just going through the motions of doing the work or are you actually looking at is this what is the purpose where what where, what gives me fulfillment from my work am i headed in that direction i think that's a next level thinking for yourself and then a d- even deeper thinking was what do i want from my life am i able to balance the things my work my family my relations my other you know hobbies to a point where i will feel fulfilled from my life and that's the third level of the and that's for yourself and i think if a person actually takes the time and does a little bit of that i think the extension of that will come naturally once you have done that for yourself it's actually easier for us to see that in others when we have actually uh, mirrored it within ourselves so it's a little bit of introspection there i love that and it reminds me of something you know i i've had a conversation with a number of people at different times where they're you know they're working and maybe they're not really enjoying their work and you know every every job has some things that you need like and some things that you don't mm-hmm. uh, and there's this this little exercise that i've had people do where i say okay if you rate you know your days from one to five, um, where one is, this was a terrible day. And five was, this was a great day. And like three is kind of like, I can take it or leave it. Like you should have fours and fives on a pretty regular basis. And if you don't like, you should get a new job. (laughs) Cause like we, you deserve to have something, a job that you enjoy. And to your point, caring starts from a place of being in, like joyful, being happy, being in a in a situation that is something that you like. Yeah, and I will also add a little bit there, Kevin. One thing, just coming from a place of empathy here, because I have been in those places too. Sometimes life does not give us the luxury of those choices, right? Totally. Because we have other things we care about, other responsibilities. Uh, we need a job to pay our rent, pay our schools, our kids' school fees. You know, sometimes. People need the job to even put food on the table. So I will not, um, I want to caveat that, that, you no, know, in some you're sense. You're absolutely we... right. You're absolutely right. And it's not, I, and I want to be clear, I'm not coming at that from a place of judgment, right? Like no. there are times when we make that choice because of other things going on. And that is a deliberate sacrifice. And that is 100% like valid where I, what I um, am trying to push against there is the sense of this is what I, this is all I can get. This is all I deserve. Or this is, this is what I should expect from a job. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. And, and totally. Yeah. I, I knew you were coming from that place, but I wanted to make it clear for our readers because I didn't want it to sound like a very privileged conversation. Oh, I choose what I want to do. And even if we have to make those um, sacrifices at times where we are doing something we don't really love for the sake of some other greater good, I think that is also a powerful thing because it raises in us, um, It, it uh, I think it strengthens that muscle, which can appreciate that in others too. Sometimes others are making those choices. And so given that sacrifice, I would still challenge the person to say, hey, I am doing this job for the money which I need, but what can I do to make sure that you know, my overall life is still balanced. Are there are there some other sources of joy that I can uh, tap into? Uh, can I treat this work as a commitment or a learning exercise that maybe once I get to something which I really enjoy, I'll be better at it? So there are ways I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, I absolutely love it. And I really appreciate your, your pushing on this because I think it is really a very important distinction. Um, maybe we can actually go in this direction. So say you're in that type of situation where for what and you know this often comes up with you know people get trapped for a variety of reasons people get trapped for external reasons people even get trapped for like visa reasons right i yeah. i really empathize with the people who you know, were working at twitter on visas and then went through the takeover and debacle and change and are stuck there and they may want to get out but they cannot so when you find yourself in that type of situation um do you have any kind of mindset approaches or, or tactics that you can, uh, that you would recommend to do what you said of like, okay, how do I use this knowing that I'm in this subpar situation? I'm here for reasons that are valid and I don't want to change it now, but how can I transform this experience into something that, that moves me to a better place? 
Yeah, and I think I started dra- down that track a bit already when I was talking about, you know, some of the muscles we build. I do feel adversity is actually a great blessing to us in disguise many times because it really helps us hone and polish our character, our strengths, um, our belief in ourselves, because once we overcome that adversity, we come out more confident and stronger. So, um, you know, there's that part of it. And that I think in applies to anything, not just work. And I have been through some hard times, um, including a divorce, a death of a parent, very sudden. But I think that mindset really helps me stay grounded that, oh, this is happening. There are things that I cannot control, cannot control at all. But what I can do is how I deal with this. And I think that mindset in general, even at work, there are some many factors outside. Are the CEO of a big organization changing and you know, just changing everything in the organization is not something in an individual developer or a manager's control. But I think what we have a choice at that point is how do we deal with this? Yes, I'm stuck here. Yes, this is what I need to do to, uh, you know, keep taking care of my family, myself. One, how I show up day to day is going to help me build my muscle. I mean, I can go depressed. I can stop doing the work that I I was doing because this this doesn't make sense anymore. Or the other way is like, hey, I've been dealt this card. Now let's see what are some good things we can get out of it. You know, maybe this is a good time uh, for me to show up for my team. There are others around me who are also feeling similarly. And uh, maybe this is a good time for people to connect deeper together because adversity does that too. People dealing with the same problem tend to connect, share, and get stronger together. So collaboration increases surprisingly when we are dealing in a, with an outage. By the, so I'm just again playing on yeah, an example. Yeah. So so we become better friends, better coworkers, better colleagues. Um, are there skills that I can learn, including dealing with abrupt change, sudden uh, ideology, you know, radical ideologies? that can help me later in other spheres of my life, including my next job. So how other, sometimes just watching other people and how they are dealing with things also give give us those skills. And some of those things are hard to get unless you experience them yourself. You can read a lot of books, but this is a chance I've gotten. I'm experiencing this myself. Third thing, maybe I can get smarter, right? Okay, I'm in this visa situation or this, uh, you know, tight job situation right now. how do I learn from what happened right now to see how I can predict this better in the future and maybe prepare ahead? Um, um, maybe, you know, this is the type, the kind of role or the skill or the organization I'm part of is not the only thing I can, de- you know, work on. Maybe I build some other skills so that I increase the diversity of jobs that are applicable for me. Um, some people also um, build themselves more, uh, I guess, spiritually mm-hmm. and their mindset um, improves a lot in those situations. I've noticed people start, um, uh, you know, they might be, you know, they're always busy to ever take out time for some um, exercise or meditation. But sometimes when things like these happen, these are again opportunities for you to invest in some of those other things that can improve you as a person. So yeah, just some example. It's a really good point. I remember I, first started experimenting with meditation when I was in a bad job situation. I, I had totally forgotten that, but that is is absolutely true. Um, and what I love about what you just said here is you're highlighting, like, I think there's sometimes this idea that, oh, everything bad has a gift in it. And I think that's not true. Some things are just unilaterally bad, but we as individuals choose how we respond to it. And we can create opportunities for ourselves out of these things, even if they are unilaterally bad. Uh, yeah, well, at, at the very least, we'll have a bad pattern detector. <laughs> Maybe we can avoid those in the future ahead. But I don't know. Sometimes just things are out of our control. Even accepting that, I think it takes effort and takes building some muscles, right? Like, you know, totally. this is not something I can change. So. Well, and I think it's something that is... Our culture is really bad at this idea that there are things that are just bad that happen and it's out of our control. Um, I encountered this. Um, I also lost a parent. And like, I think our culture has this idea of, 
oh, that's terrible. And there's got to be some good lesson for you in it somewhere or something. And I'm like, no, there is no good thing in this. And it's a crappy situation, but it is also something that we all as humans will go through at some point. Uh, and so one can create something for yourself out of it. I now am better familiar with how to help someone going through the same experience. And some of it is saying, no, this is terrible. There is no good in this. Like, that's okay. Uh, like that, <laughs> yeah, that happens. I, yeah, totally. I just had a friend who got diagnosed with cancer third stage uh, last year. And no way are you going to go and tell that person that, oh, this is a good thing that happened. No, no, it was not a good thing. It is not a good thing. It's a hard thing. But I think what I think helped her was just saying that, hey, once you are done with this, you're going to come out stronger for it because you would have learned to deal with something really hard. So, and that's true. I mean, dealing with adversity does build some muscles. So even though it's not a good thing, it does help us hone some things. We never realized actually that we have the ability to deal with. So, Yeah. All right. Well, we've kind of gone off on a, a challenging area, but I, I think it is an important one. Um, let's come back a little bit to work. Uh, and I want to follow some of the, one of the things you mentioned is you're getting very much into kind of using tech for social impact and meaning. And so I'd, I'd be curious your thoughts on, how we can align our work, which often feels like it's completely disconnected from our uh, you know, concerns about the world, and bring those things together into some sort of harmony. Yeah, thanks for asking that, Kevin, because I have been asked that question many times over the years as I started venturing into this area uh, while working full time in my regular job. People were always amazed and curious, like, how are you doing this? How can we do more there, too? And someday I'm going to write a blog about it once I get my act together. But I do want to say this, that no matter where you are, whether you are working full time, or whether you are devoting all your time to nonprofit work, there are ways we can all contribute. And I highly encourage people to think about that. And I think it will start with thinking. But it doesn't need to be huge or big or a new title or a new organization to really make a difference. It can start small. It can start around us in our teams, in our communities. Um, so, for example... If you have a diverse team, you know, just giving people a chance to share what's going on. For example, there were people from um, Iran in our broader organization and there was all of this stuff going on rega regarding the, the women's movement and how uh, people were revolting. And it was a big, big thing in people coming from that country, but not everybody really understood the depth. And so we created some forums where people couldn't come and share what was going on and how they were feeling about it and how others could support. And it can start as small as you going and attending some of those things. And it could be in any area. If some people care about certain education more, okay, sure. Then, you know, if there is a mentorship program going on, they were we were doing some things where we would go out to high schools and share our career and just enable the younger generation or give them more information about how things happen, uh, even volunteering at your local schools or um, the food shelter or the, you know, the homeless people shelter. It can sm start small with volunteering. And many of the, thankfully, many of the bigger organizations do encourage that. You can log your volunteer hours. You can, you know, get extra donations for charities you care about. Money, obviously, is another way which is there to help. There are sudden natural disasters that happen where people immediately need a lot of support. You know, we're dealing with the Maui wildfires recently, things going on in Ukraine. Um, then there are things where we can actually see how we can put more of our skills to use. These are, I think, things most people can do, but uh, we all work in technology are there things um, that technology can do, which others, you know, can we add that other unique advantage? And that's where I'm, I'm digging more right now, because I do feel there is a big disparity between the private tech sector and the other, you know, the broader social world, whether it's government, um, you know, how government uses technology, uh, even simple services, like 
even now dmv is a harrowing experience for more pe- most people right it's just and i every time i go there i think i feel like many things could be f- become more efficient just by systems and um but anyhow uh, again going off on a tangent but other places are non profits i see like i have been actually looking at roles which are technology leader roles in non profits working on social equity and startups too but it is such an interesting area it is a niche area still where social work and technology work and having enough investment in a tech product and a team it just narrows that venn diagram down to very tiny slice and that is a shame because technology is powerful and again you know i spent a lot of time at google one of the things which really motivated me in my job was the mission and i could see that playing out people were able to help themselves when they whether they were trying to learn about something new find a job a health diagnosis and just you know there are ways we and now during covid we realized again the power of technology whether it was connecting people across uh, you know families countries um or um online school lots of things so it's just i feel like now we are in that space where tech can really help and i would encourage people to see even in the immediate job you are doing are there aspects of that job if you are working on an advertising product how can certain social spaces advertise better uh if you are working on an e-commerce platform are there ways for smaller businesses to actually thrive make a living you know i'm sure we all or you know there are so many dimensions of technology i think it it probably takes us a little extra effort but if we can identify those opportunities and sometimes different people have different skills like i'll say i'm not sure if i have the skill to go out there and just build something out of an idea but even thinking about it and contributing those ideas in spaces where there are other people who might be interested or who are already thinking about that space but suddenly get an additional uh, powerful tool in their hands is a great way to make a difference so again uh, i like to talk and i, I am uh, i i think of a lot of things at the same time so please do channel me into where you well, want me to so connecting this back to our earlier conversation one of the things i'm hearing is essentially like we it it comes back to caring we as individuals have things out in the world that we care about whether it is social justice or helping people recover from wildfires or you know helping people in ukraine or other areas and if we have those top of mind and are willing to to bring that caring back with us into work often there are opportunities or places where either directly in work as you highlight you know maybe there's a way to create a program within work or an offering or even just a discount program for nonprofits or what whatever it might be to start trying to apply your help those things we care about directly at work and also like our technical skills are extremely valuable mm-hmm. sometimes they can be directly applied and i also i one last thing i i do want to reemphasize is don't underestimate the value of giving money the amount of money that flows into tech the tech industry and that by virtue of having a technical job we have access to is mind blowing relative to many parts of the world and many even uh, types of careers within the United States. And so often we can have an outsized impact if we are willing to spend some of that money to help places where money is a, a much scarcer resource. And yeah, that's a great point, Kevin. I want to underscore that actually. Thanks for pointing it out because I think when I started initially, again coming from a developing country, that that notion was not completely built in my head that how much charitable donations I could do. But if your employer does an employee match to a certain amount, I would say I would encourage people to actually donate to that amount at least because it makes a lot of difference to a lot of uh, organizations in terms of. what they can do with that money a dollar goes a long way outside of the us in many many places so um, don't under- yeah definitely thanks for pointing it out okay we're getting close to the end of our time um is there anything that we haven't talked about today that you want to make sure that we cover before we wrap up um not really no this was a good conversation i just wanted to say that um i would not say that to 
I would encourage people to not wait for something to start caring. I would say that this is something which should naturally be flowing in our day-to-day lives. And it does in many spaces, but even at work. And I would also encourage people to show up authentically about that. Because all the things I mentioned about vulnerability, creating psychological spaces, creating trust, it boils down to us role modeling that as an authentic whole person. And and I think uh, change begins like as close as home to within us, actually. So uh, encourage people to think about that. Absolutely. Well, and especially if you are people who are through one form or another safe to do so, right? Managers, we have more power to do yeah. that. We can do that with less repercussion. Uh, if you are in an organization, maybe you're an engineer, but you are like me, you're experienced, you're white, you're male, you're part of the majority culture, you have a lot more ability to put yourself out there safely than someone who is not as much of a part of a culture uh, or who is disadvantaged in one form or another. And by doing that, you create space for them to be able to do that as well. So I think, you know, one always caveat when we encourage people to show up authentically at work is like, to the extent it's safe for you to do so. And if you are a person or in a role that makes it safe for you, by doing so, you start to open the door and make it safer for those who are maybe not safe at the beginning. Thanks for pointing that out. That's also very important. I automatically was thinking of managers and people with power, and I feel our responsibility is higher there because you have authority. But you're right. You know, even even there, if there are places where um, authenticity can clash with safety. It's not, yeah, this is not a universal message that way. But uh, to be honest, I even feel like people who have power, who are in the majority, more privileged uh, subset, there are also points where they may not feel safe. So it applies universally, right? Uh, That there are those uh, areas where we may not want to show up uh, fully. But that said, even recognizing that about each other automatically, I think, depends the level of caring because you suddenly, you know, I think we, we get into those spirals about talking about privilege and that person won't understand this and this person won't understand this. But if we all acknowledge that we all don't understand some things, then again, we are at the same level in some way. Totally, totally. And if we aren't safe in our current location, maybe we can start looking for ways to become safe either by leaving that or by making the that location a little bit more safe on or uh, one very important thing asking for help i have noticed that many of us type a people don't really reach out and it could doesn't mean asking for help from your manager it could be a peer who you identify with it could be a professional uh, resource Uh, I do think there is a lot of power in reaching out for help. Most of the time, the biggest problem is us not doing that as opposed to not getting the help we need. Totally. Uh, One quick plug around that. There are lots of people getting into the coaching industry. Coaches can be a great resource for that. Most of them offer some sort of free exploratory or consultation to begin with. So if you are stuck, you don't have anyone to ask, you can look out for someone. Yes, they'll probably try to sell you down the road, but they'll also offer you some free help and it it may be you know, useful. So if you have no one to reach out to, look to someone who's offering that professionally and, yeah. and see if you can find it for free. And by the way, thanks for flagging coaching. I feel like coaching and mentorship are other powerful ways of giving back because then you are sharing your expertise, your experience, to multiple people helping them come up and then amplify the impact. So um, thanks for also raising that. I I, I have personally benefited from uh, professional coaches um, a few times. And I think the introspection thing, and there's a resource I can also point people to. There's One of my coaches mentioned a design your life workshop. And I didn't do the workshop, but I did look at the YouTube video. It's a Stanford course, actually. And it was very informative and really helped me introspect. So there are sometimes these resources or things um, that coaches bring to you that can really help you uh, move forward. All right. That's it for this human skills interview. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking this video and subscribing to this channel. You can also subscribe to the human skills newsletter, which there's a link to right down below to get notified of interviews like this as they come out. Take care y'all. This is K-Ball signing out.